Welcome to our talk on Utopian Design, Feminism, and Critical Design. Um, I'm Sharon Bartel with uh, in Indiana University School of Informatics and Computing, along with um, Yongsu Atieri. Uh, she's an artist and also my PhD student. Um, I just want to take a moment to just thank um, BCRW for inviting us. It's quite an honor to be here. And I especially want to thank Anne and Pamela for um, their incredible help um, during the planning process to make this trip possible. I also have um, just a Barnard connection I'm dying to share. Um, um, I have, been, um, have the privilege of advising one of um, the top master students in our program, Melissa Rodriguez Zinga, uh, who received um, the degree from Barnard a few years ago in anthropology. She's doing exceedingly well. She loved her. Uh, are you surprised? Um, um, she did really well, and then um, she always raved about her experience here. And it's just my great honor to actually visit her on my martyr. So that's my connection to Warner. Um, so I want to begin by kind of giving you some um, background information to situate the talk. Um, TV, movies, consumer culture ideologically construct us a certain kinds of subject with adverse implications. And in general, design is typically seen as part of the problem. As you see here, we can have a lot of critique about these um, because they contribute to issues such as social injustice, environmental destruction, unwellness, uh, insatiable consumption, which need to have the next fastest thing, and also alienation. So the broad position I'm arguing is that design can be appropriated as a methodology within the progressive research agenda. The specific argument I will explore today is critical design has optics for a feminist utopian progressive research agenda. Okay, so just a quick overview of critical design and feminist utopia to get us on the same page. A call for utopian has emerged in recent feminist research, most notably in the world by Moy, Cornell, and McKenna. Feminist utopia is about more than a, an image of what a good life would be, but becomes a claim about what it could and should be, according to McKenna. Synthesizing feminist theories work, there are three key principles of feminist utopia. The first is about critical engagement with the world, which allows us to see new and more complex relationship between various aspects of existence. Uh, accordingly, our horizons of experience can expand and the possibilities of future become more numerous. The second key principles of feminist utopia is embodiment. It's about making visible, situated, embodied human needs, including gender similarities and differences, human sexuality, pleasure, desire, and emotion. The third principle is the notion of process which combines pragmatism and feminist political theory with an emphasis on ev evolution. It's about multiple possible futures in progress, not about the final perfect end state. Feminist utopia is an ongoing task. Now that I sketch out what a feminist utopia is, let's turn our attention to research through design. Research through design is a recent movement in human-computer interaction where I'm from. Um, and they borrow heavily from the design discipline. It's about the design, the design researchers making things, not as an attempt to create some kind of commercial um, success, but instead as a way to investigate uh, what gives shape to our material reality. So design activities, especially the constructing of artifacts, becomes a central research activity. So you can look at research through design as an open-ended and embodied explorations of the design space that contributes more to the designer's sensibilities and the problem-forming abilities than to the understanding of empirical reality. So on the slides, I list uh, some of the research agendas in human-computer interaction that use or can use research through design as an input. Um, critical design is a species of the um, research through design genus. The primary outcome is knowledge, not design product. This is a form of research and I leveraging designs to make consumers more critical about their everyday lives, 
and in particular, how their lives are mediated by assumptions, values, ideologies, and behavioral norms inscribed in designs. So in a nutshell, critical design is a research through design methodology that foregrounds the ethics of design practice, reveals potentially hidden agenda, and explores alternative design values. Don and Raby of the Royal College of Art in the UK, who, term, who coined the term critical design, argued that most designs are affirmative in the sense that reinforce the social norm. And critical design sees itself in opposition to affirmative design. Don and Raby once said that usually when we discuss big issues, we do so as citizens, yet it is as consumers that we help reality take shape. The act of buying determines the future by presenting people with the hypothetical products, services, and systems from alternative futures, people engage with them as citizens and consumers. In other words, critical designs probe our beliefs and values, challenge our assumptions, and encourage us to imagine how that what we call reality could be different. So I see some commonalities between critical design and feminist utopia. They both blur activism and research. They both share a commitment to action research. They both engage dialog dialectically with our mundane reality, just, post, just post against alternative futures. They both are process-oriented. They are very pragmatic in nature rather than endpoint-oriented and idealized away from today's everyday reality. They both use defamilization and provocation as methodology. They both take um, embodiment seriously. They also have um, genealogical underpinnings rooted in critical theory and cultural theory. So with that, I want to turn the, uh, the presentation to Yong Suk, who's gonna walk us through some of the critical designs that we're doing in our research group that explore the notion of subjectivity in ancient times. Hello, my name is Yong Suk Artieri. Thank you so much for having me today. And um, I'm very honored to collaborate with uh, Professor uh, Chow and Barzell. And a special thank you to Jeff Barzell, who is here and contribute our uh, project. All right, so today I will present uh, my critical design in a computer, uh, human computer interaction design field in a subject matter of defamilization of a persuasive technology. Okay, so before I start talking about my design, uh, I will mention that there are two trends in um, personal informatics. So the first one is quantify the self. So technology track data about your life, which you can use to optimize your behavior or habits, like a calorie counter. So while another one is a persuasive technology, which seek to persuade user to more desirable behavior, like eat healthier, quit smoking. So which we're gonna talk about today related to my design, slightly different way. So, so um, oh, before go with that, all right. So both the quantified self and persuasive technology are enmeshed in ideological discourses. But among technologists, they are not always acknowledged, such as like a health public to prevent the obesity, might tacitly, um, tacitly reinforce unhealthy body image, contributing anorexia or bulimia. So in my case, watching my behavior could make me more obsessed with my body images. So that is my motivation making my critical design. So what does it mean when we construct human experience as a computational problem with a computational solution? So now I will talk about myself and my design. So to provide uh, some contextual background, I recently developed some critical design in the space of Fred's self in anxious times. So to begin thinking creatively about this topic, I look inward, I thought about myself. So subjectively, I recognize that I consume sweet thing when I feel anxious. And then second, it makes me even more anxious due to societal pressure to be fit. So I feel really fragile when I feel that I'm doing something wrong by eating sweet or food. 
And then I blame myself for fe uh, feeling guilty under social construction. But importantly, you know, I was thinking that things do not have to be this way. Perhaps there is a way out. I try to think of a way, play with it, and make it strength and make it positive in an artistic way. So I introduced a range of metaphors, symbols, and concepts to do in my critical design to explore boundary in an interaction between personal space and social construction and technology. So my goal is to bring attention to the social assumption and value of a body through the critical design concept. So first the concept I've been trying to convey was that I interpret body as a source of feeding energy. So eating, of course, provides the energy to help me sustain in ad addition to societal concept about eating. And eating makes me breathe and grow and continue to live. So I embedded this idea into my hatching scarf and then poeticizing the act of eating rather than I feel guilty when I'm eating food, which I recognize as make me go in a direction opposite to being thin. So, and it gave a chance to rethink our body as a place nurturing. And I intend to, uh, for the human body to be understood as a part of nature. So hatching scarf this design conceptualized the body as a source, uh, core source that engage with a strange persuasive technology. So the particular design is concerned with uh, how the body feels and how differently the user experience from the interaction formed in an organic way, not we talking about like a major quantified information from the device. So the focus is on the situated body or a body, a live with the body concept. So let's uh, look at the video and we will have a chance to interact with uh, my hatching scarf after our presentation in person. Hatching scarf is a computational interactive design that blurs the boundary between object and self, extension of a body that expresses anxious behavior fashionably, symbolically, even poetically. The way it works is that whenever the user reaches into the attached pouch, which might contain chocolate, the scarf shape changes in response to the motion of a hand in the bag. Its visual and interactive vocabularies are inspired by the way Mother Bird brings food to the desk for her chicks. In a similar way, the scarf hatches in the larva. It vibrates and breathes life when its doors open up to the world through the act of eating. The scarf also offers a critical interpretation of a persuasive technology. Is it better or worse for the scarf to be open or closed, moving or still? Is the snack in the pouch a guilty food such as chocolate or healthy snack? Hatching scarf doesn't know and it doesn't tell you what to do or what not to do. Inspired by feminist and phenomenological theories of a libido body, it encourages reflection and expression, but reserves judgment. Thank you. So, as you saw in the video script, another theme I intended to convey is use of the scarf as a tool of self-expression. So the scarf blurs the boundary between object and self, and an extension of a body reflecting and expressing, uh, expressing anxious behavior, the externalized that uh, the phenomenological experience of a fragility, anxiety, of a guilty, even pleasure. So another, my critical design example is a suicidal holder. So one of the social assumptions in Korea, which I grown up, um, if I smoke in public, that is really bad because I'm a woman smoker. <laughs> so if I do that, guys are really surprised to see it. And, uh, Often I have to find the quiet corner of a cafe with my female friend. So literally it said that I'm getting married, so I'm quitting smoke. So, but, but I like to smoke actually when I feel you know, anxious or you know, I'm stressed out like today. So I, <laughs> so I feel really fragile and feel guilty when I feel that I'm doing something wrong. Again, it creates a conflict between my personal desire and then also so, uh, society ideals. So how can I acknowledge and express the conflict feeling of a guilty pleasure, danger, and comfort of smoking? I explore the boundary between my personal space, social construction, and technology again. 
So before watching my uh, last video documentary for the, this design, I will introduce you a, a brief concept of a design. So the main idea behind creating this critical design was that provide great opportunity for users to enrich their experience in their everyday life. So it involved a unique interaction capable of reflecting human behavior while uncovering hidden engagement that I tried to attempt to convey. So the figure include the petal or wing, which is symbolize a fresh life form, falling down or destroy as a direct result of user interaction. So this design will not give a, f a full content of uh, uh, its information about function, but I hope the user will discover new idea in surprising way. So as my last slide today, present, I will let you watch the video. The title is the Suicide Holder. The Suicide Holder is one of several critical designs that researchers at Indiana University are using to explore the fragmented and fragile self in anxious times. Suicide Holder is a computational interactive design that encourages its user to reflect on their person as both object and subject of knowledge. Suicide object is essentially a cigarette holder with a twist. As the user removes a cigarette from it, a fountain is activated that sprays water at the sculptural pattern or wings that surrounding holder. But this pattern or wings are constructed from sugar and the spray of water causes them to melt like a neuron dying from a straw caused by cigarette use. Suicide object is, in obvious sense, an allegory for smoking. Indulging it, it is self-destructive, but unlike the repulsive image commonly used to support the smoking kills message, which often shows smokers mutilate bodies, suicide object is alluring. It is pleasant to look at and to interact with, causing the water to spray the delicate sugar foam melt them is engaging and beautiful. In this way, suicide object simultaneously acknowledges the desire, pleasure, and moral danger surrounding smoking, and it does not resolve them for the user into a single simplistic message to smoke or not to smoke. Instead, it offers the disturbing and complex message that destroying fragile life can be aesthetically pleasurable, like a smoking itself. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I will be happy to talk to you after Shawan's uh, presentation, and there is a hatching scarf you can interact with in person afterwards. So she will present more about critical design. Thank you. Thank you, Young Suk. Um, now that we present these as critical designs, they may prompt questions such as whether they are critical, in what way are they critical, and how do we judge the criticality of a design? We have been thinking quite a bit about these issues, and I want to share with you some of our approaches. So we can say that the Yongsuk's designs are critical because they queer persuasive technology and personal informatics applications. They can see, they can actually be seen as a satire or parody of these systems. The designs do not understand right or wrong. The designs are agnostic about what it means, and it does not provide a single unifying message. We can also argue that these designs are not critical um, because they foreground body habits that society considers negative, reinforcing hegemonic um, body narratives. Although the designs don't take uh, a stand on whether or not it's correct, our society does, and is these social norms may actually overwhelm the intended ambiguity of the design and provide it a unifying um, reading. Here I provide a different example, the evidence doll by Don and Raby. So um, these two designers have the questions of how do we as a society react to biotech and how does that imp imp impact our lives? So the, what they did is they asked a group of young and single women to imagine a doll that stored DNA materials from a male lover that they can be used later in the future. So they used this as a conversation um, probe in order to kind of talk to them about concepts such as designer baby, DNA thefts, and things like that. And then also invite graphic designers to annotate the dolls with words and drawings and images from the transcripts that they have with these female um, interviewees. 
We can argue that evidence dolls are critical because they facilitate an embodied exploration of an alternative future. They are guided by everyday single young women as opposed to biotech's understanding of what women's perception or needs or values are in this top, on this topic. These dolls express and reflect the words and images of women, not some impersonal imper scientific aggregation or content analysis. We can also argue that these designs are not critical because they assume a heteronormative present and future. It's the graphic designers, not the women themselves, they are annotating the, the dolls. And the work was done in the context of an art museum. It actually was exhibited in the Pompidou Center in Paris a few years ago. So that the women involved are likely to reflect a privileged point of view. So as we can see from these examples, design criticality is hard to pin down and is open to interpretation. We don't know exactly how to judge whether a design is critical and being good feminist, we ask who gets to decide and who are the winners and losers when we design something is critical. So to answer these questions, uh, my colleagues and I attempting to, are attempting to theorize critical design as an approach. This is a multi-year project and for me, I've been thinking, in, especially in the context of this conference, about the potential connection between feminist utopia and critical design. To theorize critical design, we undertake a, a three parallel and interrelated activities. For the analytic activity, we turn to critical theory, critical culture, and aesthetics to unpack what it means to be critical and how to, criti how to characterize criticality. We also undertake the embodied activity of making, like what Yongsu has done, in order to think, critique, and reflect through things. Along with analytic and making activities, we, also we are also developing strategies for critics and design practitioners to evaluate the criticality of a design. We see criticality as a measure of a distance between the status quo and an alternative or new world of reality. Moving forward, I would like to suggest a set of opportunities for further dialogues between critical design and feminist utopia. First, feminist utopia can contribute to critical design's ongoing theorization of embodiment. Second, although we have explored design as a critique of our everyday reality, there is an opportunity to develop the feminist utopia dimension of critical design which is missing in the current literature. I also propose that critical design can serve as a research strategy for feminist utopian research, and critical design extends not just products, but also services. Let me spend some time to unpack these. Don and Raby like to use critical design to seduce the viewer into the world of ideas and rather than objects. So we can read this as something that's rather in disembodied. But I think a strong focus on embodiment can bring about epistemological and practical benefit for critical design in the sense that our bodies give access to a first-hand experience of the system, and our bodies are also the locus of any resistance to the system. Feminist utopian's positioning of the future as movement, evolution, becoming in relation to our material reality it seems to be a good theoretical fit for critical design. Critical design claims to be a transformative of, or changing the nature of the demands, but how do we know critical design is not just about some kind of fantasy? According to Carl Freeman, uh, who writes about scientific, science fiction theory, cognitive speculation can be a mode of utopian thinking, which is about thinking about the future in such a way that you can actually bring about the future. So cognitive speculation thus provides a pragmatic account of how to get from here to there. I can also see critical design as a feminist methodology. If feminist utopianism is about an ongoing labor and critical design can be a, a form of that labor, because critical design is situated, is embodied, is an embodied practice of the critical engagement with our everyday reality. 
and critical design help reveal how embodied experiences are constructed by designs with implications for design. And the last opportunity is to think about critical design as service. A service relationship is a distinct, complex, and systematic relationship, which with a particular focus on sensibility, accountability, and intention. It is through the presence of a service relationship that intentional change and the consequences of intentional change can come to have meaning and give meaning to the individual and collective lives. So to conclude, I see design can be part of the solution as opposed to part of the problems. Specifically, we can see there seems to be a fit between thinking productively between critical design and feminist utopia. Each can potentially contribute to the other um, in that the feminist thought can improve the ongoing theorization of critical design, especially with regard to speculation, embodiment, and ev ev evaluation. And critical product and critical design, product service design, can serve as an approach to feminist action research. So with that, I want to acknowledge um, the many conversations that I had with our colleagues and our students, and especially for the support of um, a couple of funding organizations. And above all, thank you for listening. <laughs>